following recent terrorist attacks. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention. Landmark Cases, C-SPAN's special history series produced in cooperation with the National Constitution Center, exploring the human stories and constitutional dramas behind 12 historic Supreme Court decisions. Number 759, Ernest Miranda. Petitioner versus Arizona. We'll hear arguments in number 18, Roe against Wade. Quite often, and many of our most famous decisions are ones that the court took that were quite uh, unpopular. Five, four, four, five. Please Let's go through a few cases that illustrate very dramatically and visually what it means to live in a society of 310 million different people who help stick together because they believe in a rule of law. Good evening and welcome to Landmark Cases. Well, we're about two-thirds of the way through our 12-week series looking at historic Supreme Court decisions. Tonight's the 1954 case of school segregation, Brown v. Board of Education. And we're going to begin this evening by listening to Linda Brown on the roots of this case. My memory of Brown began in the fall of 1950, in the quiet Kansas town of Topeka, where a mild-mannered black man took his plump seven-year-old daughter by the hand and walked briskly four blocks from their home to the all-white school and tried without success to enroll his child. Black parents in Topeka felt that the day of trying to enroll their children in the school nearest to their home was long overdue. Many were the evenings my father would arrive home to find my mother upset because I had to take a walk, just like she did many years before, and catch a school bus and be bus some two miles across town. I can remember that walk. I could only make half of it some days because the cold would get too bitter for a small child to bear. I can still remember taking that bitter walk and the terrible cold that would cause my tears to freeze upon my face. That's Linda Brown talking about her experience as a school child in Topeka, Kansas, and how her story led her to the Supreme Court and one of its landmark decisions. Tonight, for the next 90 minutes, we'll learn more about that case, how it came to the court, and what its implications are. And let me introduce you to our two guests at the table who will help us do that. Tamiko Brown-Nagin is at Harvard University, where she teaches constitutional law and history. She's the author of Courage to Dissent, Atlanta, and the Long History of the Civil Rights Movement. Welcome. Thank you. And Jeffrey Rosen is at the table tonight, they, a Constitution Center in Philadelphia, which he's the president and CEO of has been our partner for this entire series, which we thank you for. And he's the author of numerous books on the Supreme Court, including The Supreme Court, The Personalities and Rivalries That Defined America. It's nice to have you at the table finally tonight. It's wonderful to be here, and congratulations on this great series. Your team has done such a great job, and oh, it's really a thrill. Thank you, and all, for all your help as well. So as we get started here, let's talk very big picture and uh, on the issue at, in this case. What was really the heart of what was decided here? Mm -hmm. Well, the Supreme Court in this case considered the question of whether state-mandated segregation in schools was constitutional under the 14th Amendment, and thus it was an opportunity for the court to reconsider Plessy v. Ferguson, which was the 1896 case in which it had found that uh, segregation on rail cars was within the Constitution. And Jeff Rosen, why did this become a landmark decision? Because by overturning Plessy, as Tomiko so well said, the court effaced the stain of this decision and fulfilled the promise of the Reconstruction Amendments. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution, passed after the Civil War, which turns 150 next year, was designed to ensure equality of civil rights. And Justice Harlan, in his dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson, thought it was uh, obvious that a fundamental right, like the right to travel on railroads, was a fundamental civil right. 
But the basic insight that the court finally recognized was that separate but equal is inherently unequal, and to separate people because of their race is stigmatizing and degrading. The fact that it took you know, almost 100 years to recognize what was obvious to anyone uh, in the South, as Justice Harlan said in Plessy, he, Justice Harlan said, everyone knows that the purpose of segregation was to degrade African Americans. And the fact that it took so long for the court and the country to recognize that is what made Brown such a landmark in the 20th century. So it, it is known in our society simply as Brown. But one of those little factoids that people who are learning about this along with us uh, would be surprised, perhaps, is that Brown isn't one case, but it's really five cases. Explain how that works, the consolidation. So there were a bunch of them, and I have to have my cheat sheet, actually, to, <laughs> to get them out because they're not well known today. But uh, one of them involved the D.C. government, involving whether the federal government, as well as states, could have separate schools. And to decide that case, it was called Bowling versus Sharp. The court couldn't use the Equal Protection Clause because that only binds the states. Instead, it had to use, and I'm waiting for my chance to bring out my National Constitution <laughs> Center pocket constitution, it had to use the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, which uh, prohibits Congress from depriving any person of due process of law. And the court read into that clause an equal protection component. It's a technical doctrine called reverse incorporation, but basically, they said it would be unthinkable that if the states can't discriminate, then uh, D.C. can. But there were a bunch of very other, of other really, really interesting cases, including one that was prompted by protests uh, uh, by the plaintiffs. Here they are. The only win for the NAACP was a case called Gebhardt versus Belton out of Delaware. That time, the trial court did our, uh, order that African-Americans be admitted to the segregated schools. The Davis decision came out of Virginia. Uh, which challenged segregation in Prince Edwards County. And then finally, there was a case called Briggs versus Elliott from South Carolina, uh, which was the first of the cases. But it was uh, there were human stories behind each of those cases. And it's almost uh, a coincidence that Linda Brown, who so movingly spoke, became the face of, of all five cases. Mm -hmm. How does the court decide to and join cases like this and into one, one specific case and then give it that case's title? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that in this circumstance, it consolidated these cases because they raised the same issue with the exception of Bowling versus Sharp, which is what uh, Jeff uh, spoke about. Uh, they were consolidated for convenience and because it made sense to consolidate them and consider um, this issue as it was raised in these several states. The NAACP strategy uh, involved filing cases in the states where the issues were most stark as to um, the reality that they were able to show in Brown, and that was that separate was never truly equal. That is what the court decided, um, that Justice Brown's decision in Plessy, where he said that if there is a harm of separation, of segregation, it's only because uh, blacks are putting that construction on it. Uh, in Brown, the court rightly recognized that really the problem with segregation in schools uh, and segregation generally, the court went on to uh, stipulate, was that it was it was a stigma. Uh, it was a sign that blacks were considered inferior. One of the things that has made this whole series work for us is your participation, and there are several ways that you can do that. Uh, you can phone us, and we'll go to calls in about another 20 minutes. And uh, here are the phone numbers, 202-748-8900 if you live in the Eastern or Central time zones. And if you begin dialing now, you can get into the queue. So 202-748-8901. Please be careful when you're dialing those numbers uh, as well. Mountain and Pacific time zones. Then you could also send us a tweet. If you do, make sure you use the hashtag Landmark Cases. We'll see it in our Twitter stream here, and we'll mix your comments in. And finally, there's a discussion already underway on our Facebook page, C-SPAN. Uh, is the, a Facebook site, and we have a, this video that you just saw posted, and there's comments already coming in underneath of that. You can be part of that discussion as well. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say about this case and, and to hear your questions about it. So we're going to spend a little bit more time on the history that goes into this case. I do want to learn a little bit more about Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. And you mentioned that it was a transportation case. It was. And this was a time when Jim Crow was not yet up and running. So a law requiring segregation was not welcomed universally by the railroads themselves. Uh, it was challenged as a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. And as Tomiko well said, uh, Justice Brown held for the court uh, 
uh, as long as the cars are equal, there's no problem because equality is all of facilities is all the Constitution requires, and any imputation of inferiority is the problem of African Americans. Justice John Marshall, ha John Marshall Harlan wrote one of the greatest dissents of the of the, of the of the 19th century. This is a Kentucky former uh, slave state. He's a he's a know nothing turned abolitionist. He says, "I'd rather be right than be consistent." He's the one who, when he's writing the decision, uh, dissenting from the court's decision to strike down the Civil Rights Act uh, of 1875, his wife puts the pen that Chief Justice Taney had used to write the Dred Scott decision, and he realizes that this is the pen, and suddenly has writer's block, the words flow. So this oh. is one of the great defenders of the promise of the Reconstruction Amendments in the 19th century. And in his spectacular dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson, he basically says that everyone knows that the real purpose of the separation was not for the convenience of both parties, but to degrade and stigmatize African Americans. And then in famous words he said, in respect of civil rights, uh, the Constitution neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. The Constitution is colorblind. There is no caste here. But there's an odd uh, preface to his decision, which is jarring by modern terms. Mm -hmm. He says, the white race at the moment is preeminent. So it will continue to be if it maintains its traditions. But in respect to civil rights, there is no, uh, the Constitution is colorblind. So he was uh, continuing this distinction that Lincoln and other, um, you know, uh, Reconstruction people at the time maintained between civil and social rights. He was saying, you have to give civil rights to everyone, but we're not mandating social equality. That nowadays has a sort of uncomfortable tone for us. I think that's right. Um it's almost as if what Justice Harlan's saying is that um, it, it's overkill um, to dirty up the Constitution with um, these kinds of racial classifications. Um, he, you can read the preface to that wonderful part of his opinion where he says the Constitution is colorblind as in a way saying that because of social conditions, um, it, it, it's, it's not necessary uh, really to stipulate in the law to have our Constitution um, besmirched by this practice of segregation. So can, a can question... Can I just add one thing sure. on this because it's so important and, and interesting? The big... Uh, this dissent is so important that Thurgood Marshall reads it before he argues Brown v. Board of Education. Yes. So he's inspired by Harlan's yes. dissent. But as, as we know, nowadays, and we'll talk about this later in the show, the huge question is whether when Harlan said the Constitution is colorblind, did he mean that all racial classifications are impermissible? Or was he saying something narrower that really it's just with respect to civil rights, fundamental rights, that the Constitution can't uh, have racial classifications? Also, is he saying no classification or is he saying only classifications that affirm a caste system? And this is the big debate over affirmative action. So really the entire history of... Uh, what the Equal Protection Clause means is set up in that single dissent. Absolutely. Well, that actually gives rise to the next question, which is the legacy of that decision. And it's so hard to compress the next 50 years into a couple of sentences, but we really must for time. So did the Plessy versus Ferguson, which, which legalized separate but equal, it was a transportation case, but it changed society. Did it, in fact, give rise to the Jim Crow laws or would they have happened anyway? You know, that's a very uh, hard question, but it's probable that after the compromise of 1876, when the Republican Party, in exchange for uh, winning this contested election, uh, got out of the business of enforcing Reconstruction, would not have had the force of will to actually resist Jim Crow as it arose. So I wouldn't say that, uh, I'd be very interested, if Tomiko disagrees, I wouldn't say Plessy caused Jim Crow, but it certainly could have out, come out the other way and might have stopped it. I think that's exactly right. I, I would not uh, ascribe to the Supreme Court that kind of power at that time. It was pretty late uh, in the day. The politics of the situation that Jeff described are really important, but it nevertheless is a, an important indication from the court um, and uh, an indication from the court to which there was no great outcry um, in the public, uh, thus suggesting that by this time, there had been a consensus reached that um, the South would do what the South would do um, in terms of uh, race relations. So I need to fast forward to 1940s America, yes. uh, where things are actually beginning to move in a more positive direction, uh, notably the, the effect of the, uh, the war 
and uh, the contributions that African Americans made during the war. War in 1947, there was the desegregation of uh, 48, rather the desegregation of the armed forces. In the sports world, Jackie Robinson integrated baseball in 1947. So how were things beginning to shift in society in the late 1940s? Mm -hmm. Well, you put your finger on something that's really important, and that is the impact of the war um, in terms of African-Americans serving in the war, uh, but then coming home to this country and being mistreated, including because of the segregation laws, being mistreated um, by virtue of the law, uh, but also experiencing terrible inf incidents of violence. Uh, and the juxtaposition of the soldiers having fought uh, Hitler and his creed um, with their treatment here in this country, where they felt as if they were experiencing the same kind of uh, ideology in this country, was enough to make the soldiers vital in the struggle for uh, civil rights. Other things that were happening were that African Americans had migrated in substantial numbers to the North, which meant that they were a force in politics, um, which was important to changing a sense of where African Americans belonged in society. You mentioned um, the, the movements in sports, which was very important, all of which was to say that African Americans were gaining stature, um, and they also were um, beginning more so than ever um, to think in terms of resisting these Jim Crow laws. So Thurgood Marshall is going to become an important player in this case. Uh, later on in his life, he becomes the first African-American appointed to the Supreme Court. But in 1940, what was he doing? Uh, he has founded the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund in order to launch a legal campaign against segregation. And he does so with a strategic brilliance that uh, has come to be seen as decisive in the Brown victory. He looks at public opinion. He sees the forces that Tomiko has so well described. He knows that the presidency is turning against segregation because of the Cold War, and it's really bad. The Russians are saying, look at these hypocritical Americans who are segregating. And so Truman desegregates the military, and the uh, Truman and Eisenhower administrations both are supporting desegregation. But then Thurgood Marshall looks at the country as a whole and says there's still uh, segregation in public schools is deeply entrenched. A majority of states have it. He wants to start smaller, first by attacking uh, segregation in law school admissions and graduate school admissions, and then um, after having won those victories, attacking schools. He doesn't initially argue that Plessy versus Ferguson should be overturned. Instead, he says uh, he attacks unequal facilities in the te Texas case, Sweat versus Painter, where he says you're not even providing an education to African-Americans and this uh, separate law school you've set up is patently un unequal. In the McLaughlin case, he, a graduate student is literally demeaned by having to sit separately within the school. He's humiliated and degraded. And that is clearly unequal. After having established those two precedents, finally there's the big debate about whether to actually call that Plessy should be overturned and that public school desegregation should be attacked. And that's what Thurgood Marshall leads. Well, let's take a look at this map, which will show you what the public school system looked like in terms of segregation in the early 1950s. If you look on the screen, the reddish-pink areas, segregation in those states in the South was required. Uh, the orange states segregation local, locally determined, the blue states no segregation laws, and the green states in the northeast uh, and midwest segregation was strictly prohibited. So that was the situation going into this uh, defense of, this, uh, of by Thurgood Marshall of uh, the um, uh, using, rather, the legal system to approach segregation in schools, and that's really at the heart of this case. We're going to listen to Thurgood Marshall next talking about the legal system and his thoughts on how to use the courts to address this problem in America. What is striking to me is the importance of law in determining the condition of the Negro. He was emancipated by law and then disfranchised and segregated by law. But I submit the history of the Negro in this country demonstrates the importance of getting rid of hostile laws and seeking the security of new friendly laws, federal, state, and local. 
other civil rights activists would choose different methods to make the case, Thurgood Marshall chose the law. Can you talk more about that? Sure. Well, as, as Jeff said, the strategy that was uh, implemented by Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston, the blueprint was it was gradual um, and it was brilliant ultimately. It also was daring uh, and risky in the minds of others at that time who were equally committed to black freedom. People like A. Philip Randolph, Ralph Bunch, uh, Roger Baldwin at the ACLU were skeptical of using the courts and the law to achieve emancipation, social change for African Americans. Um, partly this was because people like A. Philip Randolph were interested in an interracial labor movement as the path to equality. Uh, there were those like Ralph Bunch who thought that, well, the courts are only as good as the personnel on the court. And it could be expected that the judges would reflect the racial attitudes of the majority of the population. Therefore, why think that the courts would be a good venue for vindicating African-American rights? Uh, and then there were those who said that even if Thurgood Marshall and the Legal Defense Fund were able to prevail, segregation, excuse me, discrimination could continue, notwithstanding the change in the law, which is perhaps the most profound criticism uh, that uh, could be made. And I have to say that all of those critics really were on to something. And that's really the difference between constitutional law in theory and on the books and on the ground. Ultimately, all of these people were saying that individuals uh, are the, the face of the law that people experience on an everyday um, basis, and they were skeptical that individuals would really um, come through in the way that Marshall imagined. Next, we'll learn how the story of the Brown family made its way to a federal case. But before I do that, let's start mixing in your comments. First, uh, Jeff Rosen is Kathy Balin on Twitter who asked, did Brown actually overrule Plessy? Brown was limited to education. Did SCOTUS ever say they were overruling it? Brown did overrule Plessy. Um, it was uh, applied to schools. And then in subsequent cases, the court applied it to desegregate swimming pools and other public facilities and so forth. But uh, the, the, the main question was, should Plessy be, over, Plessy be overturned and, and Brown overturned it? I will say, I think what the caller may be um, uh, getting at is the way in which the opinion was written um, and the fact that in the opinion, uh, Justice Warren writing for the court um, used language saying, to the extent that there's anything in Plessy inconsistent mm -hmm. with what we're saying, um, then we pull, away, we pull back uh, from the principle of Plessy. Uh, so it wasn't the kind of robust uh, over language of overruling that you might see in uh, some other cases. And I think that was by design. It was a strategy for um, the court to try to um, be a consensus court. And there's another that's exactly right. And uh, there were other parts of the opinion that by failing clearly to say segregation was wrong at the time of Plessy and is wrong now because it's stigmatizing and degrading, gave critics of Brown the chance to resist it. There was most, uh, for first Warren says, whatever may have been the state of public education at the time of the 14th Amendment, now it's really important and it has to be given to everyone on equal terms. But there was the famous footnote 11 yes. in which uh, the court, um, coming off of uh, some findings in the trial court, cited the famous doll studies of Kenneth Clark that had found that African-American children had lower self-esteem and were more likely to choose white dolls than uh, African-American dolls. And this was controversial and led the people who were resisting the decision to say that it was based on bad social science. Today, there are those, I think Tomiko is exactly right, that a clearer uh, overturning of Plessy might have made it harder to resist Brown and would have made it harder for critics of that footnote today, including Justice Clarence Thomas, who th says mm. that the court was wrong to rely on sociological evidence uh, Justice Thomas would have preferred that the court in Brown simply say the purpose and intent and effect of segregation is to degrade and therefore Plessy is overturned. You're listening to C-SPAN's Landmark Cases. We will be back in a moment. Roberto is watching us in Berrien Springs, Michigan, and you're on. Good evening to you. 
Hi, good evening, Susan. Actually, one slight correction. I'm calling from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Oh, okay. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but anyway, I want to congratulate you and the National Capital Center and uh, Mr. Rosen there for a wonderful uh, series. I'm really enjoying this thoroughly. But now I'll get to my questions. <laughs> Hello? Yes, we're listening. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Um, my first question is, um, did the framers believe that segregation was a violation of equal protection of the laws, and w- given the fact that the nation's capital was segregated? And, and with this in mind, could the Brown decision have been made using a rigid interpretation? And the final question is, when the Fifth Amendment was passed, obviously it didn't have an equal protection clause. So in the Bowling versus Sharp case, could the Bowling versus Sharp case been decided using a rigid interpretation? Those are three great questions. Shall I yes. I'll give it a shot sure, and then you sure. do it too? Yes. Um, so read Michael McConnell's great article, Originali- Originalism and the Desegregation Decisions. It's in the Virginia Law Review, and it's the best attempt to create a uh, originalist defense of Brown. But let's, let's, the, here's the bottom line. Here's what we know. There were those in Congress in 1868, and John Bingham was among them, who thought that basic civil rights had to be available to all and wouldn't have allowed segregation there. At the same time, Felix Frankfurter commissioned his law clerk, Alexander Bickel, to write a long study. And it's pretty clear that the people in 1868 who proposed the amendment, uh, who ratified it in 1868 and proposed it in 1866, did not think that schools had to be desegregated. People actually stood up in the Congress that proposed the amendment and said, don't worry, this isn't going to apply to schools. So in order to say that schools are covered as an originalist matter, you really have to move more to around 1875 when the uh, Congress was more liberal. This is a problem for originalists because if you really think what matters is what the framers and ratifiers thought, then Brown is hard to justify as a matter of original interpretation. And no current justice has really done a great job in explaining why it is consistent with original understanding. I'm going to stop there because we're going to run out of time. We'll get back to that uh, later in the program. Felton is watching us in Silver Spring, Maryland on your on. Good evening. Yes, my uh, We're listening. comment is, do you think that after hundreds of years of segregation and, and its adverse economic impact on black families, today and in the past deserve some type of reparation to the justice system for black American families? Thank you. Well, that question has been debated by a lot of people, and um, I think that there are certainly good arguments to that effect. Um, the, I, I think m- most people come to the conclusion that um, there are two problems, one of which is politics, um, and the other of which is a concern um, about how one would actually assess um, the damages if one could uh, convince uh, the right people that reparations were appropriate, how would one actually um, go about figuring out uh, what was owed now one might say that well, just give it a shot, <laughs> but uh, you know it, it's a question that's been debated a lot, uh, but really the the problem is a political problem and next is Robert Frostburg, Maryland. Hi, Robert. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing? Yes, ma'am. I'm a Vietnam veteran. And one of the things that have just devastated me is, first of all, democracy has never lost anywhere on earth and has been respected everywhere. Imperial colonial uh, supremacy and caste racism has been, last century, was driven out of every, all over the world just driven out of their lives because it's so intolerable to people. And now I fought in a war where we were driven out that colonial mentality and caste racism. Here we talk about Brown versus uh, Topeka, Kansas, and the education system. I mean, it is so insane that we still hold on to this stupid prejudice. We had a civil war over this insanity. And yet, my country, with all of the beautiful principles that it has, and people have learned to respect it all over the world, yet we keep on holding on to what was driven out all over the world last century, whether it's armed revolution or nonviolent revolution. People are tired of that caste racism. They're tired of it everywhere on earth. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, first, I will say thank you for your service. 
Um, the second thing I will say is that you make a fantastic point, which is that the U.S. has been able to uh, export democracy um, to many places, and there are many nations that look up to uh, us for our system, for our constitutional system, and yet it is true, um, I would say, that there still is a chasm uh, in many instances between um, what I call before law on the books uh, and our aspirations as a country and as a people and everyday practice. Uh, and partly that's reflection of the fact of something that I said before, which is that, and something that, frankly, the court was uh, concerned about at various times, and that is the ability of law to change people's hearts or everyday practices. Um, in order for there to be uh, social change in the way, in race, race relations, in the way that um, you aspire to rightly, um, it, it really has to occur not only institutionally, but interpersonally. So I want to show a piece of video next. This was used in one of the lower court cases that you described earlier, Jeff Rosen, Davis versus County School Board of Prince Edward County here in Virginia. And it's interesting because it documents the differences between white and black schools in this county in Virginia. But what's interesting about it is that both sides, the plaintiffs and the defendants, use these pictures st stating that they supported their position. So let's watch. These photographs are exhibits in the court case Dorothy Davis versus the school board of Prince Edward County. The Davis case was wrapped into the Brown v. Board case before the Supreme Court. What we're looking at here are the exteriors of the schools. Here's a white school in Prince Edward County, Virginia. Notice that it's a brick two-story structure in a neighborhood, landscaping, and sidewalks. While here, we have several buildings that compose a single school, some of which are brick, some of which are tar paper, and it's a, in a rural setting. Now we move inside to the classrooms. Here we have a white school in Prince Edward County. Notice that the students seem relatively comfortable. While we take a look at uh, African American school, children are wearing coats. There's a very large heater in the middle of the room, uh, thus showing us just how cold it was in, the, in, the, in these rooms. Moving on to other parts of the buildings, here we have a home ec class in a white school. Notice much of the furniture and appliances are relatively new and modern, while in the African-American schools, it's a much different story. It's in a basement, the materials are much older, and also you can tell, much more worn. These exhibits were submitted by both the plaintiffs and the defendants to show on the plaintiff's side that these facilities were unequal, whereas on the defendant's side, they wanted to show that these facilities were just about equal. So as we're looking at those, we have to talk about how one of those cases, the Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, made its way into the federal courts. First of all, uh, is the Brown, in this case, the Linda Brown that we saw earlier? It is Linda Brown, and she was the daughter of Oliver Brown, uh, who uh, uh, was a, uh, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he was a, uh, in, in Topeka, and he was a welder uh, in the shops of the Santa Fe Railroad. That's what, again, I have to look uh, for, right. for exactly for the facts. He but, was also a part-time preacher. And then some of the pictures you see, you see that they had him wearing his collar, or he chose to wear his collar, which adds another dimension to this case. He does. It was very powerful. But he was not, he was brought into the case. He was approached by the NAACP. He didn't seek them out. But the reason that, one reason that the NAACP and Thurgood Marshall chose the Brown case and not those other cases was to avoid a dispute about whether or not the facilities were equal. The fact that both sides in the Prince George's case had the gall, we would say, after seeing those photographs, to actually present them and say, look, they in fact were equal, was confusing, according to Marshall. And that's why he picked a school where there was no allegation of uh, separate but equal facilities. He was stressing the fact that Linda Brown, as she said in that incredibly moving introduction, did you hear what she said about her tears okay. freezing up as she walked to school? The fact that she had to walk six blocks to a school bus than to take a long bus ride to this segregated Monroe Elementary School, whereas uh, there was this other school, Sumner Elementary, which was seven blocks from her house, and we could, she, which she could have walked directly to, for her and for her father was an indignity and an outrage that was self-evident and didn't rely on exactly whether the facilities were equal or not. 
So it was filed in the U.S. District Court February 28, 1951. And uh, the arguments before the court, NAACP was represented by Robert Carter and Jack Greenberg, uh, arguing for Topeka School Board Lester Goodell. And it was a three-judge panel, Walter Huxman, uh, Arthur M Mellett, and Delmas Hill. And Judge uh, Walter Huxman wrote the opinion. Can you tell us anything about that opinion that's, mm -hmm. that we should know about for this yeah. story? Well, the important aspect of that opinion, I would say, uh, is that although um, the judges rejected the application of uh, Sweat and McLaren, which were two cases where the NAACP had prevailed, um, it did include a finding of fact indicating that segregation uh, of schools uh, was harmful, which was incredible. Um, for the NAACP, it's precisely the issue that was um, so controversial before the Supreme Court. So it was a decision that on the merits was adverse to the NAACP, but in terms of that little finding of fact, there's a little nugget in there um, that was very helpful. So, Jeff Rosen, could you explain then once again how it actually, these cases made it to the Supreme Court? Were the justices looking for a case to decide this? Uh, what was the process where these five cases were consolidated and the court agreed to hear them? Uh, I don't know that the justices were uh, looking for it, but there was a disagreement among the lower courts, which increases the possibility that the court will uh, take the case. It was very important that the uh, president had both the Truman and Eisenhower administrations had filed briefs. Uh, Philip Ellman, a former clerk for Felix Frankfurter, wrote a brief that he considered the most important of his entire career, where he methodically went through the court's previous precedents and showed how they compelled the result in Brown. So I think to a certain extent, the court felt that it couldn't avoid it. But then something very dramatic happened. I don't know if this is the time to tell the story. Probably not. Okay. So <laughs> I, I, can't, I, wanna, I wanna, can't wait to tell the story. I want to so. keep my audience okay. coming in. <laughs> no, but, I'll wait for you to uh, ask me. <laughs> let's let's uh, take two more calls, and then we're going to talk about what the Supreme Court looked like in, in 1952, because, in fact, this course, the court, uh, excuse me, this case was heard twice by two different courts. Uh, and we'll talk about the yes. drama that caused that uh, court to be different the second time around. Gary is in Tampa, Florida. Hi, Gary. You are on the air. Welcome to our program. Thank you. Um, while I am aware that there were impeach Earl Warren signs on southern highways, uh, what I'm curious about was Brown versus Board of Education in issues, say, in the 1956 presidential campaign or the 1960 or the 1964 or 1968, et cetera, uh, I don't remember uh, reading about if it was a specific issue raised in any debates, and I'm just uh, curious to hear some feedback. Well, I don't know that I can talk about presidential debates and Brown versus Board of Education, but I can say that it was a it was made a highly salient uh, issue in politics, certainly in the South, where there was um, deep resistance to Brown. So. Um, if it wasn't uh, uh, debated in formal terms, it was certainly um, something that was talked about. Earl Warren was a focus of, uh, you know, he was the person from which one wanted a pound of flesh, right? He was the representation of uh, Brown and the court and the sense that the court had been activist uh, in a way that it, it had never been before. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, clear that Brown was an issue in politics generally. Uh, I'm sure that uh, at various moments um, it was an issue in presidential politics. Certainly it became an issue in presidential politics during the, uh, the Nixon campaigns uh, and later on after the court had actually started to enforce the decision. Josh here in Algona, Iowa, and you're on C-SPAN. Welcome to Landmark Cases. Hi, I just want to say quickly, I hope that C-SPAN will expand on their 12 historic cases and do another 12 historic cases uh, here in a little bit. Let's but do my it. Question was, <laughs> absolutely. My question was, uh, did Justice Hugo Black, who had been a member of the KKK, and also the majority opinion in Korematsu, redeem himself by voting to end school segregation? Such a great question. And as you say, Hugo Black... Uh, is appointed to the court by Roosevelt soon after he's appointed. Uh, it's reported that he was in the Klan. There's an outcry 
he gives a radio address, and just check it out on YouTube, because it's remarkably unadorned. He stands before the mics and he says, I did join the Klan, I therefore resigned. I never rejoined. This is all I have to say about the matter. And everyone goes, bravo, Justice Black, you've really done it. You've answered all of our questions. And he was allowed to go on. But in fact, the outcry, which led to protests around his house, must have made a deep impression on him because he joined some path-breaking opinions recognizing racial equality and criminal procedure cases. And during the Brown case, he's the one Southerner the, um, in the initial vote, and we'll tell the story in just a little bit, who actually is very keen to vote to strike down segregation. Some have speculated it was, in fact, to redeem the stain of his Klan membership. He's also the only Southerner who says at the conference, um, there's going to be blood and people are going to die. And we should announce a clear rule and get out of here because the court cannot solve this. So he really is bringing his political wisdom to bear. There's one final story that's interesting. Walter Dellinger, a former solicitor general, was a clerk for Hugo Black. And uh, at one point, uh, he... Uh, asked uh, the justice, you know, so Justice Black, why'd you join the Klan? And there's this silence among the other clerks. They can't believe that he asked him. And Black paused for a moment. He said, son, if you were running for a Senate in Alabama in the 1920s, you'd join the Klan too. So that was his excuse. But I think he felt the need to redeem himself. And perhaps he did some of that with Brown. Your question's a nice segue into our just brief discussion of what the court looked like in 1952. Uh, the Chief Justice was Fred Vinson, and if you watched our, our series last week, you will remember that Fred Vinson was a Truman appointee and in some cases described as a tru Truman cr crony, uh, and he was joined on the court by Justices Hugo Black, Harold Burton, Tom Clark, William O. Douglas, Felix Frankfurter, Robert Jackson, Sherman Minton, and Stanley Reed. So last week we heard that Vinson did not do a very effective job at bringing coalitions together for the very, very divided court. In 1952, was it still very, very divided? And uh, was he having a difficult time um, bringing together two groups uh, within the court that really didn't see eye to eye? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the basic problem with Vinton is that his colleagues were, did not respect him very much. Um, and thus, he did not have the institutional authority that was necessary to uh, try to bring the justices together, is what I would say. Um, the division that I think is most important to perhaps talk about is uh, the rivalry between Jackson and Frankfurter on the one hand, and uh, Hugo Black um, and uh, Douglas on the other. Um, and what that represented in terms of uh, how the justices thought about uh, the Constitution. Uh, I'm sure Jeffrey will have uh, things to say about this. Um, but the, the thing to say about the first combination is that there was a belief in judicial restraint and a concern about um, the justices uh, uh, issuing holdings that were legal holdings and not uh, political uh, and so a lot of concern about how to actually deal with Plessy. Um, Plessy is a president that was on the books for a very long time. And Justice Jackson and Justice Frankfurter uh, were concerned about how to justify a decision to overrule Plessy. Can I just mm -hmm, uh, sure. pick up on that? Tomiko so well describes the fissures on the court. And they become manifest uh, in the first conference over Brown. So as, as Tomiko says, the colleagues don't respect Vincent. Frankfurter at one point had threatened to punch, uh, Vincent had threatened to punch Frankfurter in the nose because Frankfurter was, was, always, was the Harvard professor who yes. was always condescending to him and treating him like a Truman poker buddy and they didn't respect him. So the initial vote is something like four votes to strike down segregation, Black, Douglas, Minton, and Burton. Uh, at, uh, three votes possibly to uphold it, Vincent from Kentucky, Stanley Reed from uh, Kentucky, and Tom Clark from Texas, and two who seem undecided, Frankfurter and Jackson, who, for the reasons that Tomiko said, are in favor of judicial restraint. They don't like segregation. They're New Deal Democrats, but they don't think the court should be stepping in here. So the initial vote is taken, and it looks like the segregation is going to win. And then all of a sudden, before the court can decide the case, Vincent drops dead of a heart attack. So on the funeral train, on the way home from the funeral, Felix Frankfurter says to his colleagues, this is the first indication I've ever had that there is a God. 
Yes. He was not a nice, <laughs> not a nice man. Not nice. But then the court reargues the case, and Warren comes in, and you probably want to wait to hear what happens I, I the do. second time around. Because the first, I want to get the, the attorneys on the, on the uh, uh, docket for our viewers, because there's a familiar name. Uh, uh, the defendant attorneys included John Davis, who has been in now three of mm-hmm. our landmark cases. Who was John Davis, and why was he at the helm in so many of these important cases? Well, he was the presidential candidate, uh, unsuccessful presidential candidate, um, turned one of the great appellate lawyers of his age, courtly, silver-haired, fit. Uh, You could call him a strict constructionist. He definitely said, I don't believe in a living constitution, although I do think the constitution can occasionally adopt as the evolution of the Commerce Clause shows. But he really did feel like he was defending Southern traditions. And for him, this is an easy case. He says, look, The courts have repeatedly affirmed segregation. Plessy's on the books. The text uh, doesn't forbid uh, uh, segregation. The original understanding clearly allowed segregated schools. He thought he was going to win easily. And for him, he's so invested in this case that after the oral argument, this is in Richard Kluger's great book, which I want all of our readers to read to really uh, simple justice, gives the wonderful human stories so well. At the end of the oral argument, Davis has tears in his eyes. Yes. Uh, Thurgood Marshall said that's how he actually was invested in mm-hmm. maintaining segregation. Mm-hmm. And on the uh, other side of the lead uh, counsel was Thurgood Marshall, as we've mentioned. I want to get these other names in here because some of them are the big names in civil rights. Robert Carter, who was part of the NAACP legal team. Uh, Spotswood Robinson, arguing the Virginia case. Lewis Redding. Jack Greenberg, uh, argued part of the Delaware case. And George Hayes and James Nabrit. Um I want to show another video next because you talked about the impact of this social science experiment, the Dahl case, on the justices thinking on this. So we have a video with uh, about Kenneth and Mamie Clark who had conducted this test, and it's and we'll talk more about its impact on the uh, justices deciding this case. Let's watch. The Dahl test was integral to the Brown v. Board of Education because. It clearly demonstrated that separate was not equal and separate was not good. In fact, separate was an injustice. What we're looking at here are the dolls that Drs. Kenneth and Mamie Clark used in their doll studies. The doll tests were a series of studies that Mamie Clark and Kenneth Clark did to try to determine racial awareness in young children, with the implication being that in a segregated society, if children are aware of, of race and the differences in race and the differences in how different racial groups are treated, that it would impact how they felt about themselves. What they did that actually became very well known in part of the Brown case was they showed young children black and white dolls and they would ask the children, show me the doll that's nice, give me the doll that's the best, give me the doll that looks like you. And more often than not, the black children showed the doll as the doll, the nice doll was the white doll. The doll that was the best was the white doll. When he got to that last question, give me the doll that looks like you, that's when the children would pause and um, be a bit more confused or looked troubled, as Dr. Clark would say, because they had said in many cases This is the bad doll. This is the nice doll. And so remembering that they had said this is the bad doll, they now had to show the doll that looked like them. And um, it was particularly difficult for them. And some children, some black children, would do... And some chose the white doll that looked like them because they couldn't embrace. Um, After having said this is bad, not nice, they um, couldn't embrace it. 
How often does the court rely on social science uh, in making its decision? Was this an unusual thing that this became part of their thinking? Mm-hmm. So that's a good question. You know, uh, Justice Brandeis <clears throat> in practice um, had introduced the reliance on social science into lawyers' practice. Uh, and so it was not the first time in Brown versus Board of Education that the court relied on the social science. I think, though, that what made this different was that first, over time, uh, and I'm sure uh, it was true then too, there was some question as to how reliable the doll studies were. Um, it really was sort of a simple kind of experiment, and um, one could raise questions about the methodology and all of the things that we um, would, would think about today in terms of the reliability of social science. Uh, so no, it wasn't altogether new, but on the other hand, the extent to which the Brown opinion ends up relying on the doll studies and on the idea that black children feel inferior because of segregation, I, I think was profound. So we left the story with the death of the Chief Justice. Now, was it because of the Chief Justice's death that they decided to rehear the case, or was that already going to be reheard? Um, that is an important question. Do, uh, I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, they did decide to rehear it because Frankfurter asked for rehearing. Um, so my, w- was it right that he died after the rehearing had been granted or before? I- I'm not sure about that detail, yeah. whether he, um, what role they his were- death uh, played in the rehearing. But the court couldn't come to a decision after hearing the first round of oral arguments. Uh, they chose not to. And Frankfurter... They chose not to. Uh, I mean, they, they could have voted. Mm-hmm. Um, Frankfurter, who tried to take credit for everything, <laughs> insisted that he knew, first of all, he had special insight into the South because he had taught Southern students at Harvard Law School, so he really knew how they would <laughs> react. And then he said, if we just commission this paper about the original understanding of uh, desegregation, that'll... Uh, give us some time and maybe allow a consensus to happen. So anyway, Vincent dies. Frankfurter says there's a God. And then Earl Warren is appointed by Dwight Eisenhower. Who is Earl Warren? Earl Warren is the former governor of California. He was the Republican candidate for vice president in 1948 when Tom Dewey ran. And he is a tall, uh, blonde, uh, all-American, moderate Republican. This is someone who'd really made... um, uh, civil rights, one of his callings in California and called for the uh, people to be brought together. He does have one stain on his legacy, a very important stain, and that is supporting the Japanese internment that you talked about so vividly in the Korematsu case. And as Attorney General of California, he had supported that. It wasn't until the end of his life, in his memoirs in 1976, he finally expressed remorse for the Japanese internment, and he wept when he reflected on what he'd done. But he was nevertheless a very, very moderate. Uh, and remember, this is a time when the Democratic Party had been the party of segregation and the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln. So for Earl Warren to be in favor of civil rights at the time was not unusual. He had wanted the first Supreme Court seat. Dwight Eisenhower promised it to him. Then Vincent dies and Warren says, give me the seat. Eisenhower said, I didn't promise to make you chief justice. Warren, consummate politician, said, you said the first seat. This is the first seat. So he held him to the deal. Eisenhower appoints him, later says it was the worst damn fool decision he ever Mm -hmm. made. Mm -hmm. So the second set of oral arguments were heard December 7th to 9th, 1953. Uh, The court, again, I'm going to read the justices. Chief Justice Earl Warren, Hugo Black, Harold Burton, Tom Clark, William Douglas, Felix Frankfurter, Robert Jackson, Sherman Minton, and Stanley Reed. Uh, What was the length of oral arguments the second time around, and did they differ very much in the arguments made during the first set? Mm. Well, the oral arguments arguments the second time around were focused on these questions about original intent. Um, and the, the trouble there, uh, Jeffrey's already explained uh, what the problems were. The framers of the 14th Amendment were not social um, integrationists in the way um, that we think of uh, today. Uh, and so the question that was put before the lawyers, um, the NAACP lawyers uh, struggled a, a bit um, and uh, the, the problem was that um, the answer was not going to be found in the questions that had been put before um, the lawyers and the court. The, the seminal question before the court in this case, <clears throat> excuse me, does racial segregation of children in public schools 
deprive minority children of equal protection of the laws under the 14th Amendment. So I would like to have you tell the story because the Chief Justice decided that it, that for this decision to work, it had to be unanimous. How did he get to unanimity? This is a riveting decision, uh, rather story. It's a riveting decision and a riveting story of how he got there. And one of the great examples of judicial statesmanship in American constitutional history. So the arguments are heard, as D'Amico so well described, and the justices have their vote in the private conference. And Warren begins by saying this is an easy case. This is an easy case. It's obvious that segregation has the intent and purpose and effect of degrading African Americans. And then they take a vote. And it's not entirely clear what the first vote was, but it's at least six to three, maybe seven to two. And there are two major holdouts. Robert Jackson, the great advocate of judicial restraint, as Tomiko said, and Stanley Reed from Kentucky, an ardent segregationist. So uh, uh, Jackson is in the hospital. He's had a heart attack. And Warren visits him and basically says it's very important for the court that this be unanimous. And Jackson, who, as Tomiko said, can't see in the original understanding or the text or the precedent uh, or tradition a reason for Brown, nevertheless, is a new dealer who thinks that it's important and he's going to join And then finally it comes down to Stanley Reed, the last segregationist. And Warren goes to visit Reed in his chambers and says, Stanley, it's going to look bad for the court and bad for you if this is an eight-to-one decision with the one dissenter being a segregationist from the South. For the good of the court and the country, you've got to make it unanimous. And Reed, who is an institutionalist and cares about the court as an institution, agrees to make it unanimous. Warren then reads the decision to a spellbound courtroom. He he says, the question is, does segregation violate the 14th Amendment? We believe it does. And Thurgood Marshall looks up at Stanley Reed. He cannot believe that this ardent segregation actually voted to strike down segregation and looks up questioningly, says, you, Stanley Reed, you voted. And Reed nods down silently at him and says, yes, I voted for this. Just this electric moment. Mm -hmm. And a real testament to Warren's statesmanship that he was able to create unanimity. And let me read a little bit of Chief Justice Warren, who wrote the opinion for the court and what he had to say. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, we hold that the plaintiff and others similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought are, by reason of the segregation complained of, deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th amendment. I'm going to just let that stand and take some more calls because our time is evaporating quickly. Let's go to Christopher, who is watching in Brooklyn, New York. Hi, Christopher, you're on. Uh, Yes. So a majority of white people were against segregation. And I actually, um, I saw, I saw your um, preview of the baby situation. The white baby looks like an angel and the black baby looks like an ape. And death to the nigger. Pre- All right, we're just going to let you move on from here. Dennis in Palestine, Texas, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, Dennis, you're on. Last try for Dennis. We're going to move. All right, on to Ron watching us in East Chicago, Indiana. Good evening, Ron. Yes, yes, good evening. I just want to real quickly say, wow, uh, this program and discussion and, and this show has, is so vital for our survival. Kudos and congratulations for your program. This is so vital for the survival of America. My question is, what do we have to do? What do we need to do to keep this going? This discussion has to keep going. You know, our um, our neighborhoods are being robbed of our history, and you guys are doing a phenomenal job. Whether people agree with you or disagree with you, we've got to keep it going, especially during this presidential election. Yeah, I love you. I just want to keep it going. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank God you. Bless. That's very kind of you. Appreciate the good, good, good comments there. Uh, what I would like, before we leave this, I did want to get one other thing on the record, which is uh, you mentioned earlier the Cold War. And in fact, in, at least in the first case, the uh, government filed an amicus brief that made the case to the justices about the United States' international reputation being damaged by segregation. So I want to ask you both, because often we hear the court saying that it's insulated from public opinion, yet this is one of several cases in this landmark series where wars were going on, or in this case the Cold War, where there is seems to be a determined impact on the outcome by the justices' realization about the politics or policy impacts 
uh, of, of what they're reviewing. So help people understand how the court functions and what it says is an insulated study of the law environment. What we keep seeing instances where politics does impact the decision. You know, it's so important to, fo- to, to focus on this. We think of Brown as a counter-majoritarian decision, an unpopular decision that was imposing a rule of equality at a time when most of the country was in favor of segregation because of that map you showed earlier because it was so perva- pervasive. But in fact, 54% of the country supported desegregation and came down for the reasons that we've been discussing. It was an international embarrassment after World War II. It was derided as a kind of, you know, something worthy of the defeated Nazis to have this 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 kind of justice of, of segregation and inferiority. And opinion was shifting quickly. It was really the fact that the Senate was controlled by a group of Southerners who refused to bring, refused to bring desegregation bills to the floor that in some sense was thwarting public opinion. And the fact that both the Truman and the Eisenhower administration, Eisenhower is no big fan of quick desegregation. He says Warren was a big mistake, but he they, his administration does uh, support striking down desegregation. For all these reasons, the court is aware of what Congress is uh, thwarted from doing. It's aware of what the executive is uh, trying to do. It knows about uh, Jackie Robinson. And in that sense, Brown, far from uh, thwarting the general rule that the court has tended over time to follow public opinion, surprisingly supports it. So to the micro and then to the macro, we're going to listen next to Linda Brown talking about her family's reaction when they heard the court's decision. Let's watch. Time stood still as the highest court of the land pondered over Brown versus Board of Education until an afternoon in May of 1954 when I was at school, my father at work, and my mother at home doing the family ironing and listening to the radio. At 12.52 p.m., the announcement came. The court's decision on ending segregation was unanimous. That evening in our home was much rejoicing. I remember seeing tears of joy in the eyes of my father as he embraced us, repeating, thanks be unto God. And so we move from Linda Brown to societal changes. What was the reaction in the country at the Brown decision? Hmm. Well, Thurgood Marshall was greeted as Mr. Civil Rights, as a hero, as an icon. Um, There were many African Americans who were very excited uh, about the decision, very hopeful um, about the decision. The court was viewed um, over time as a... Uh, a, a hero, a protector of minorities because of the decision. Um, the country, to a lot of people, seemed to be moving in, the, in the, the right direction. On the other hand, there were those who thought that the decision was outrageous, that it was the mother of judicial activism, um, that the court had not followed the law, that it hadn't um, been faithful to um, its imperatives as an institution, that the court had... Um, put itself in the position of being a, a legislature. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of pushback against uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Some of that pushback op- occurred in the Congress of the United States. <clears throat> and I'd like to have you talk a little bit about uh, the massive resistance movement. We've got two statements, one from a member of the House and one from a member of the Senate who were involved in this. First is Josh, John Bell Williams, who made a House floor speech on May 17, 1954, And he said, among other things, the time is at hand when the states must reassert their constitutional rights or suffer their own destruction. If states are to preserve their sovereignties, if they are to preserve the Constitution, they must declare the Black Monday decision, that's the Brown decision, to be illegal and invalid and of no force and effect within the territorial limits of their respective jurisdictions. And then Senator Harry Byrd of Virginia, who organized the massive resistance movement, said... The unanimous decision of the Supreme Court to abolish segregation in public education is not only sweeping, excuse me, but will bring implications and dangers of the greatest consequence. It is the most serious blow that has yet been struck against the rights of states in a matter vitally affecting their authority and welfare. They authored what is called the Southern Manifesto, and it was signed by 19 senators Um, and um, more than 80 representatives, all of them Southern Democrats in Congress. What was the effect of this? 
the effect of that, which you summarized so vividly, can you imagine, uh, as, as you said, calling it Black Monday and then signing the Southern Manifesto was precisely to encourage Southern states to resist in the ways that the manifesto demanded. And the resistance, as Tomiko suggested, was powerful. Uh, people across the South set up private academies to educate their kids. Um, in 1959, Prince Edward County, Virginia, closed its entire public school system rather than obey a court order to integrate. And it was closed for five years. The public schools in South Carolina were closed for a great period of time. Uh, Norfolk, Charlottesville, Warren County, uh, um, schools were all closed by state officials. And then finally, the resistance culminated in this next dramatic case, Central High School, Little Rock, or Arkansas. The r resistance to allowing integration is so great that President Eisenhower has to call in the National Guard. And we can talk about that great case of Cooper v. Aaron, if you like. Uh, let me take some calls. This is Dennis in Palestine, Texas. You are on the air. Hi, Dennis. Hi. I just want to say Jeffrey Rosen is uh, uh, correct that uh, Richard Kruger's uh, Simple Justice uh, is uh, fantastic work and was an epiphany for this Southern boy who had only heard one side of the argument for uh, most of my uh, childhood and even into college. Uh, I wanted to ask about... Uh, uh, a law clerk for Justice Jackson by the name of William Rehnquist, who uh, at his uh, confirmation hearing in 1971, the issue came up that, uh, that he had, in fact, written a dissent for Justice Jackson in the uh, Brown case uh, when it came before the Warren Court. And he said in 71 that he was, uh, that was just, uh, they were just covering their bets, so to speak. He wanted to, but he did not really feel that way. And I just wonder if either of your guests have uh, checked to see the veracity of Justice Rehnquist's uh, comments at his confirmation uh, some 20 years later. You're, you, you summarize it very well. It was an important uh, controversy. The, the memo was quite vivid in which uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, then the law clerk, said basically the fact is that Southerners don't like black people and are never going to um, admit them. And uh, the truth is I believe that Plessy versus Ferguson was good law. And as you say, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, throughout his career maintained he'd been writing in Jackson's voice that Jackson had asked him to express his own thoughts because he, Jackson, was undecided. Now, all we know is that Justice's, Justice, Jackson's, Justice Jackson's secretary disputed Rehnquist's account and said that Jackson had never asked for competing opinions to be written in his voice. And according to her, Rehnquist was expressing uh, his own views. I think that's the, the most direct uh, evidence that we have on the point. Maurice is in Memphis. Hi, Maurice. You're on. Oh, good evening to all of you. Uh, the 14th Amendment does not apply to the federal government. Though we, I think we feel that certain fundamental protections are so important that they appear twice, so that the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments each have a due process clause. Um, the equal protection of the laws is a more explicit safeguard of prohibited unfairness than due process of law. But, but I would not assert that that implies the two are always interchangeable of phrases. How do you feel of, about the assertion that the concepts of equal protection and due process are not mutually exclusive? Mm. Well, I think you're referring to the controversy over Bowling versus Sharp, where the court reads an equal protection component into the Fifth Amendment. Um, there, there's a lot of discussion about um, exactly how the court does this, um, how the court explains it. Um, I don't think the court uh, goes uh, very far towards a an explanation. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that there was not going to be any way um, that you would get one holding in uh, the four cases involving the states and a different holding in the case involving um, the District of Columbia. Therefore, um, we get this uh, equal protection component read into the due process clause. As to um, how appropriate that was, I, I, I tend to think that um, there is an understanding of due process 
um, that makes it a very robust uh, concept. It's the due process clause um, is the basis that the court ends up uh, using for fundamental rights analysis. Um, so I would say that, um, uh, you know, they're not, they're not the same, um, but there's uh, an appropriateness to reading um, that component, the equal protection component into the Fifth Amendment under those circumstances. To, to, to me, it was absolutely right. If I could just add one quick beat. Justice Harlan, who wrote that dissent in Plessy, believed that exemption from class legislation or uh, unfriendly uh, legislation based on race was itself uh, a privilege and immunity of citizenship. Yes. And the court read the Privileges and Immunities Clause out of the 14th Amendment, as you well know if you watch the excellent Slaughterhouse <laughs> episode. So that argument is no longer available. But for, for some of the framers of the 14th Amendment, it might have been a less close case. Then a quick comment to Mr. Putnam on Twitter, who said, what did the Brown v. Board a decision due to the legacy of Justice John Marshall Harlan, notable for his Plessy dissent? It vindicated him as one of the great prophets of the 19th century. Uh, next is Chuck, Palmyra, Pennsylvania. Hi, Chuck. You're on. I have to push uh, the button. Brown, hey, Chuck, you're on here. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello? Hello? Yes, sir. Hello? Oh. Uh, although you say that uh, Brown reversed the Plessy decision, isn't it true that railroads continued to ignore the Brown decision and continue segregating uh, passenger uh, rail cars and, until the Civil Rights uh, Act? Well, it's not just uh, railroads. It's all kinds of um, public institutions that uh, don't exactly uh, comply with Brown, uh, the letter of Brown forthwith. Uh, so it takes a very long time, as you say, for Brown to actually be implemented. Um, as Jeffrey pointed out, there is a Cooper versus Aaron decision where the court speaks to the issue of school desegregation. Uh, the problem is that unless there is, um, in the early years after Brown, um, if, if there's not these um, dramatic instances of resistance to the decision, then the school districts are able to uh, proceed in whatever way they see fit for a very long time. It's not until the mid, really the late 1960s, uh, after the Civil Rights Act, that Brown is implemented uh, in any substantial way. Our next piece of video is Thurgood Marshall, and he gave an interview to Mike Wallace, uh, uh, famous of CBS, uh, on Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, and what he thought of the president's decision in, in response, rather, to the desegregation of schools. This was taped on April 16th in 1957. Let's watch. Well, I do not think that President Eisenhower has done anywhere near what he could have done. I wonder whether it's too late. I don't, personally, I don't think it's too late. But I think it's some, the president should have shortly after the decisions, or at least by now, have gotten on a television uh, network or radio and spoken as the chief executive of this government to the good people of the South, urging them to support the decision of the Supreme Court is the law of the land, whether they believed in it or not, and to use the full influence of his position as president to bring about peaceful solution of this problem. I think he was obliged to do that, and I think that his failure to do so does not help us at all, especially when we realize that as a result of the failure of the good forces to take over, we have allowed these other forces like the white citizens' councils and the Klan to threaten and intimidate good people. How Moral leadership should come from the top executive of the government. It's his responsibility. Five months after that decision, President Eisenhower sent federal troops in to enforce the desegregation in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, so walk us through President Eisenhower's legacy on this. So Cooper v. Aaron, as if Brown wasn't dramatic enough, Cooper v. Aaron is also incredibly dramatic. Uh, you have uh, a court order to integrate Central High School. You have students who are being turned away by mobs. You have Governor Orville Faubus standing at the schoolhouse door saying that he's never going to allow 
the students to come in, and you have President Eisenhower's decision to to uh, send the National Guard to ensure the admission of these school kids. And then you have a Supreme Court, which is so afraid that its rule to integrate the schools will not be obeyed, because they're not sure what Eisenhower will do, that each of the justices signs the decision in ink on the... Uh, decision itself. This is never done before. All of the justices, to prove their unanimity, sign it. It seems like a show of strength. In fact, it's a, it's a, it's a sign that they're scared to death, yeah. that he's really not going to uh, follow through. And there's also language in Cooper v. Aaron, language of judicial supremacy that almost overstates the case. This court is supreme in its interpretation of the Constitution, seeming to suggest the president and Congress have no role. That wasn't what John Marshall asserted. Basically, these are nine men, and that's what they were then, who literally don't know what the president will do. The fact that he did send the troops, and despite his grumbling about Earl Warren, did ultimately say the Supreme Court has made its decision, I have to enforce the law, is, uh, helps mitigate uh, Eisenhower's legacy. And there's some interesting new revisionist history saying that behind the scenes, Eisenhower you know, was aware of shifting politics, but he was more supportive of desegregation than he appeared in public. I want to show one more video, and then I'd like to come back to you and talk about this. This is actually Earl Warren, uh, taped in 1969 in an interview, and he's talking about his frustration with the resistance to the Brown decision. So let's mix that in, and we'll hear your thoughts on this. Okay. In some parts of the, the country, yes, uh, uh, one couldn't help being impatient when when uh, he would see the the uh, orders of the court uh, flouted and, and uh, uh, just uh, not obeyed in any sense of the word and where, where uh, illegal things were, were changed in form but not in substance and carried on. Of course, uh, one feels frustrated at that, but when, when the American people as a whole recognize that, uh, that we have in the past been wrong in depriving certain minorities of their constitutional rights and when we make the decision to see that they will in the future have these rights then i think uh, we're on the way to solving uh, most of our domestic problems well uh, a couple of things to say first of all i i agree that there is this revisionist uh, scholarship on uh, Eisenhower that puts a, a somewhat different spin uh, on his views. However, uh, and, and there is Cooper versus Aaron where he sent in um, the guard. Those are important. At the same time, I, I think the problem with, for Eisenhower um, as it relates to school desegregation is that there's a sense that he doesn't, first of all, he's very supportive of states' rights, uh, which is what Thurgood Marshall is talking about it. Um, and there's a sense that uh, he is not uh, really supportive of the principle of desegregation as a personal matter. Uh, so there's this story about how um, at a White House dinner, he was overheard saying that the people of the South who were resistant were not bad people. Uh, they simply were concerned about the little white girls sitting beside uh, overgrown black boys in the classroom. Uh, so I, I do think that there was not that um, personal commitment to Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and uh, he, in that sense, was on the wrong side uh, of history. Uh, Earl Warren, on the other hand, also a politician, uh, and not a man who, uh, certainly when he was appointed, was respected as a great legal thinker. His skills were political, um, understood that um, having the office of the presidency behind uh, the Supreme Court, having Congress, having all three branches um, acting in the same way as we had after 1964 was really the only way that the decision would be enforced. Let me take a call from Ken watching us in Somerset, New Jersey. Hi, Ken, you're on. Hi, thank you. Um, I have two questions. Number one, it's my understanding that despite what you said earlier, that, uh, Eisen that uh, Eisenhower said that uh, appointing Warren to the Supreme Court was one of his worst decisions. It's my understanding 
that at the time that he appointed Warren, he intentionally appointed him because of this case, and he wanted that to have a kind of a decision. And I'd like to hear your comments on that. And secondly, it's also my understanding that when Eisenhower sent troops into Arkansas, it was also the first time that the president, that the executive, has stood behind the Supreme Court, especially since uh, J- President Jackson in 1828. And I'd like to hear your comments. Well, I love the fact that you bring up Jackson. And of course, he did famously say in the Cherokees Indians uh, case, uh, he said of John Marshall's decision, perhaps apocryphally, John Marshall has made him his decision, now let him enforce it, confirming Hamilton's adage that the Supreme Court has neither person nor sword and therefore depends on the president. I had not heard that uh, Warren uh, Eisenhower appointed Warren because he wanted a positive decision in Brown. The fact that he resisted making the appointment at all, trying to renege and saying, I didn't mean you for chief, uh, seems to call that into question. And I do, I do agree with Tomiko's uh, counter, which is that despite the revisionism, on the whole, he was... He was on the wrong side here. So I'd be interested to, if any of viewers have a, a site for that, uh, please tweet it in or something like that, because it would be interesting, but I haven't heard that particular story. So we have 10 minutes to talk about the 60 years of legacy of the <laughs> Brown decision, which is just impossible to do. So I first want to start with its legal legacy. We've got uh, four citations of uh, Brown uh, in 64, Reynolds versus Sims. In 1967, Loving versus Virginia, which was uh, ra- racial integration in marriages. Uh, San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez in 73, and Planned Parenthood v. Casey uh, mm. in 1992. So if you look at its legal legacy, what, what has it left the country with from that perspective? Mm. Well, that's a really big question, <laughs> <laughs> I will say. You know, the most important uh, legal legacy of Brown, I think, goes back to the point that it established uh, the idea that the Supreme Court can be interventionist to protect individual rights uh, in the most profound way. Uh, It was cited in various cases um, uh, where um, the the issue wasn't schools um, on that point. Uh, But I will also say that Brown has a mixed legacy, uh, in part because it could be interpreted in so many ways. So you cite San Antonio versus Rodriguez. Um, There is a um, discussion of that decision by Justice Powell, who writes San Antonio, which is a case that holds that wealth isn't suspect and education is not a fundamental right. Um, that is inconsistent with Thurgood Marshall's and a lot of people's understanding um, of the consequences of Brown versus Ed, Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, so when it came to the question of what it meant for education itself, Brown uh, was not persuasive authority on that point. And there are other examples that one could point to. So I want to get this into it because with talking about the, the integration of schools, Bob Hepburn on Twitter says, so far you have not mentioned the hedge from the Supreme Court using the phrase integrating with all deliberate speed. Uh, So how did this come into play? So uh, how instructive was the court in actual rollout of desegregation? So thank you, Bob, for (laughs) noting that. It's really important. And the language came from our friend Felix Frankfurter, who always had something up his sleeve. And he said, once again, I know from English common law and principles of equity (laughs) that when you're not sure that a particular decree will be immediately enforced, you can give the parties a little bit of discretion and tell them they don't have to do it immediately. And this principle was really resisted by Hugo Black, who actually, unlike Frankfurter, who said he taught Southern Harvard law students, actually was from the South. And Black said, you give the South any room, it's going to be worse. But uh, Frankfurter put in that language, and there was lots of other hedges in that decision in Brown, too. While giving weight to public and private uh, considerations, the plaintiff should make a prompt and reasonable start. The, uh, the courts can consider problems related to administration. But disagreement, the, the, the court did say the vitality of the constitutional principles can't be allowed to yield simply because of disagreement with them. The bottom line is, with all deliberate speed, was a huge pass to the South, basically saying, go ahead, we're not going to really be on you if you, mm-hmm. uh, if you, if you resist. And as Tomiko, absolutely, this is such a central point that she made. It wasn't until not only the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 64, but the guidelines adopted by the Department of Health, Education and Welfare just a few years later that threatened to withhold federal funds from schools that didn't desegregate. Only then 
did meaningful desegregation occur? So it took more than a decade after Brown to actually achieve its promise. So the court seems to continue to struggle, at least at the university level, with uh, affirmative action cases and another one scheduled for this term in the court. So what has really been the societal legacy of Brown versus Board of Education? Mm -hmm. Another big question. Well, I I would point us to Parents Involved, which was a a case about K-12 education and whether uh, school districts could voluntarily desegregate. Um, And there the court held, uh, it struck down the policies that were at issue, um, which in uh, Louisville had been adopted, a desegregation policy adopted um, after the school system was no longer officially under court order. Um, By consensus, large consensus of the community, it wanted to continue um, with this integration program in schools. It was considered a model um, community for integration, and the court impeded that, um, saying that the principles established in the affirmative action cases regarding diversity really don't apply in the K-12 through context. And then, as you mentioned, there is the continuing um, controversy over affirmative action. The court is going to hear the Fisher case. Again, it will rule on the merits, uh, and it doesn't look good. Uh, to proponents of affirmative action. Uh, And, you know, it may not be a sweeping holding, but the the nature of the conversation that the court is having um, is really goes back to that word, some would say, of judicial supremacy. Uh, The court in the affirmative action context is saying it needs to be satisfied that there aren't race-neutral alternatives to these race-conscious policies. Uh, And there are uh, university officials, educational officials, Uh, who would argue that they need to be in that position of exercising discretion about composing their student bodies. Here's a little bit of Chief Justice John Roberts and the Parents Involved decision. Parents Involved in Community Schools versus Seattle, it was heard in 2007. Some of what he wrote is this. Before Brown, school children were told where they could and could not go to school based on the color of their skin. The school districts in these cases have not carried the heavy burden of demonstrating that we should allow this once again, even for very different reasons. The way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. There is, as Tomiko so well says, a huge debate on the Supreme Court right now about the meaning of Brown. Is it a ban on all racial classifications, as Chief Justice Roberts seems to suggest, or is it a ban on racial subordination? Does it demand colorblindness Or does it just prohibit caste-affirming laws that degrade? The court is deeply divided on this question. The division itself can be found in the Brown opinion and in Brown too, which didn't clearly resolve whether it was demanding equality of uh, opportunity, the end to formal segregation, or equality of results, actual integration. So this continues to this day. All I can say is that with C-SPAN, uh, the National Constitution Center, is going to be hosting a series of debates and conversations on all these questions, including a great one on the Fisher case uh, next week with our partners at Intelligence Squared. But this, the fact that even uh, years after Brown, more than 50, 60 years after Brown, we still haven't resolved what its central meaning is, suggests that the meaning of the Reconstruction Amendments continues to be contested and debated. My last piece of video is Thurgood Marshall. So Thurgood Marshall, as you know, was the architect of the NAACP's legal defense strategy, which decided to attack the segregation of schools as a process to help change society. Thurgood Marshall, as you know, went on to be appointed to the Supreme Court as the first African-American justice. He served from 1967 through 1991. Here's Justice Marshall at the National Bar Association meeting in 1988 accepting the Jurist of the Century Award, and he talked a bit about uh, the state of race relations post-Brown. I don't care about the Constitution alone, or the Declaration of Independence, or all of the books together. It's not that important. What is important is a goal toward which you're moving a goal that is a basis of true democracy, which is over and above the law. And it's something that won't happen, but you must pray for it and work for it. And that goal is very simple. 
That gold is that if a child, a Negro child, is born to a black mother in a state like Mississippi or any other state like that, born to the dumbest, poorest sharecropper, is by merely drawing its first breath in a democracy there and without any more is born with the exact same rights as a similar child born to a white parent of the wealthiest person in the United States. No, it's not true. Of course it's not true. It never will be true. But I challenge anybody to take a position that that is not the goal that we should be shooting for. And stop talking about how far we've come. And start talking about how close we are. And with that thought, we have about a minute left for your comments on the Brown v. Board decision in 1954 and really what its significance has been on American society. Well, uh, I think it is a decision that was important in constitutional law. It's, it's uh, generally considered the most important constitutional law case of the 20th century, and that's rightly so. Um, and it's, it's a paradox, though, because of all of the things that we've talked about. Um, Brown was not considered to be a con law case that was actually based in law, uh, right? There, there are many... Um, questions about the method that the court uses to reach its decision, but over time it is accepted as the right principle. The court did the right thing. Uh, that's important. It sets a high bar, high aspirations for us, uh, and as Justice Marshall said, uh, so many times we're still climbing towards its goals. Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence promised that all men are created equal, yet he owns slaves. It took Lincoln's new birth of freedom at Gettysburg to make the promise of declaration something closer to a reality. The Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments tried to enshrine that in the Constitution, but it took a century after that for Brown at least to begin to make the promise of the Declaration and the Reconstruction amendments a reality but we certainly have not come close to achieving that promise for the reasons we've been discussing. Our thanks to Tomiko Brown-Nagan and Jeffrey Rosen for being with us for this installment of Landmark Cases, looking at the 1954 decision of Brown versus Board of Education. And thanks to you for being part of our audience. Our series continues next week with the Supreme Court's 1961 decision in Mapp v. Ohio. In that case, justices strengthened the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures, making it illegal for evidence obtained without a warrant to be used in a criminal trial in state court. Find out more next Monday, live at 9 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN, C-SPAN 3, and C-SPAN Radio. You can also learn more about C-SPAN's Landmark Cases series online. Go to cspan.org slash Landmark Cases. You can order C-SPAN's Landmark Cases book, featuring background, highlights, and the legal impact of each case. Written by veteran Supreme Court journalist Tony Morrow and published by C-SPAN in cooperation with CQ Press. Landmark Cases is available for $8.95 plus shipping.